Okay, we're here at DIA 2019 annual meeting in San Diego, and I have the privilege of being with Nicole Mahoney. Hi, Nicole. Hello. Thanks for being here. Uh, Nicole, I'm really interested in hearing uh, about you uh, mm -hmm. first and your background and the organization you're with. So if you don't mind, introduce yourself. Sure, happy to. So I'm Nicole Mahoney. I lead the new regulatory policy team at Flatiron Health, which is a data vendor and analytics company. We have electronic health records that are used by community oncologists across the United States. And the part of the business that I work in is figuring out how we can utilize that information that's generated from these electronic health care records for drug development. Interesting. And uh, we heard today about the enormous amount of digital data that's out there from so many sources. And that's creating huge opportunities, but huge challenges. So tell us a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's true. There's a lot of promise out there, and I think it's on us to figure out how and when we could use that information um, for different purposes. You know, as I mentioned, one of the main things that we're concerned with is how can we leverage that with our life sciences partners to uh, facilitate drug development, get drugs to patients faster, or get information that we wouldn't normally get out of randomized clinical trials. Um, but of course, there are other reasons to utilize uh, electronic health record data or data generated in what we say the real world. And uh, that could be to inform traditional drug development pathways, but also importantly to inform patient care. And we're talking about drug development. Are there specific areas of drug development where we're finding the use of data being more successful? I think that's very fair to say. Um, and I think we're really at the stage of figuring out alongside regulators, other stakeholders and patients, um, and our life sciences partners, uh, when it's appropriate to use this information. So, so far the signals that we're getting from the FDA at least are that um, it may be appropriate to use real world data uh, for cases of label expansion, for example, or to fulfill post-marketing requirements. And we do work with our companies uh, to submit this kind of information in new drug applications. And we're learning that um, right now, the near-term uses are probably um, around label expansion and around providing information on new populations that's valuable but wasn't captured in randomized clinical trials or could not be captured in those trials. It's interesting that the FDA is open-minded to using uh, real-world data in that regard. Are you finding that's the case with the regulatory community in general? So we haven't um, worked too extensively, but we are starting to talk to other regulators. And I think what you'll find is um, it's a learning process and people are, have a lot of questions, especially around methods, but also things that are pretty new. Like what about endpoints in the real world? How are they different from clinical trial endpoints and how are they the same? So I think what you'll find is there are a lot of questions and a lot of people working to answer those questions. Great. I mean, obviously, being able to use the data is in everyone's best interests and helps to get medications to patients faster. What can the regulators do to help speed up the integration of, of data and evidence into their regulatory decision making? That's a good question. And I think that they're doing a lot of the things that could help and maybe um, increasing those efforts would be welcomed. So they're doing demonstration projects. And for example, our company um, has a collaboration with FDA on strictly research uh, projects to look how and when you can use real world evidence to answer specific scientific questions. Um, I think that it would be great to see more of those interactions. Um, the FDA is also very engaged in policy discussions. And I think these are the kind of things that are going to really help answer the questions that people have and the concerns and flesh out when it's appropriate to use this data. Interesting. You mentioned issues and concerns. What are the, the top risks that you see in utilizing data for regulatory decision making? So I think the real thing that you have to ask is what decisions are you driving at? What is the regulatory question that you're trying to support with real world data? We believe that a variety of questions can be answered with the right data and the right methods to analyze it. But of course, uh, there are questions um, about um, the methods that you use to control for bias, for confounding, and things like that. 
So from my perspective, a lot of the questions are not about strictly policy issues, but they're really about the science that underpins the data and how do you build trust and confidence that you can make a decision that you can stand behind. Right. And so the sources of the data are really important and making sure that, that you're collecting the population in its broadest sense. And, and how is that being done? And, and are you seeing new tools and new technologies coming forward to help make sure that happens? Yes, we are. And I think it's important to recognize that um, different sources of data can answer different questions. So there are benefits and limitations. Um, and data is not collected in one way. Right. There's uh, structured data. And even structured data is not collected one way. That's data about it. Um, demographics, for example. Things you would think are simple. It's not collected uniformly, so there's a certain amount of processing that has to be done. Um, there's also what we call unstructured data, which is literally you know, physician notes, uh, PDFs of uh, lab reports. Um, and all of that information has to be processed. So I think what you'll find is that different data vendors have different approaches, um, and even registries or other sources of data in the academic community um, to how they pull that information and collect it and curate it in a way that's usable. Mm -hmm. And has there been efforts applied to establishing common definitions and common language across these data sources? Um, yes, but I think more needs to be done, and maybe that's a way that FDA and other regulators can kind of work together with the stakeholder community. Um, so I think one thing that uh, we think about a lot is around data quality. So I don't know that it's definitions per se, because it might be hard to have a framework with common definitions that cover everything imaginable. in the whole world, yes. Uh, but I do think we might be able to agree on common metrics and processes for collecting data and knowing that it's reliable or having some kind of measure of how reliable it is. Right. So thinking about this data and this evolution of tools, are there other areas where you see opportunities for utilization of digital tools in, in healthcare product development? Um, so I guess patient care, I think filling in gaps uh, but that occur between the periodic collection of information, either in the real world or in clinical trials, might be a good opportunity. Um, so places where you can uh, provide more granular information than you get from measuring something, let's say, once a month. Right, right. And uh, is there any thought process uh, around interpolation of data and filling in more mathematically and statistically? Yeah, so I think that you're getting at that and also um, maybe how machine learning could help and there are technologies being applied in, in various scenarios. Um, the way that I'm not an expert in that, the way that we utilize uh, machine learning at my company is essentially to kind of comb a vast amount of information and find these limited patient populations that we're interested in, in seeing data on. Very interesting. Well, I think this field is so amazing and it's moving now very quickly, it seems. And even here, there are many organizations that are demonstrating new tools and techniques and I'm sure it's going to continue to explode. So uh, just in closing, what do you think the biggest challenge is? What's coming next? So I think one of the biggest challenges is just a fundamental challenge of bringing together different organizations that speak different languages and operate very differently. Um, and I'm learning that firsthand because I came from the pharma industry and joined Flatiron just a few months ago. Mm -hmm. And I'm finding that the cadence, the pace of work um, is very different in a tech-oriented company that's used to, you know, maybe I'm simplifying, but building an app and then you see a bug and you fix it and then you iterate. Whereas um, drug development is a 10-year process, 15-year process, and it's very different. And I think um, in order to make the most out of the technologies and data that are out there, we have to find ways to make sure we have a common language. Right. And so I see that fundamental personnel problem <laughs> as a real challenge. I was just going to go there. I was thinking about uh, the need for more data scientists, of course, but it sounds like you're going down the path of even needing people who are linguists 
and, and, and other sorts of associated fields. Is I that... think so. I think connectors that can kind of go between the two organizations, types of organization, um, even to educate physicians and patients on the use of some of this data um, and get them more involved. You know, I think we have a lot of work to do to connect people across sectors and then across the stakeholder community. Great. Well, that's what DIA does best. Right. And I'm thrilled that you're here and we've had the opportunity to chat a bit. And I'm glad that you're working on it because I think there's huge opportunity and, of course, huge needs. So thank you very much. I agree. And thank you. My pleasure.